uh, being in a position to pass on some experience, some background to the changes in cities and towns that you are working for and fighting for, in the, in the sense that this will go on and I can then retire a little earlier than Fred and, and, and put my feet up. Um, but uh, I, I wanted to, um, to start really by giving a little bit of background, talk about some of the people who have inspired and, and, uh, and helped me uh, in, in my work, and just touch on a few examples of uh, the emerging <coughs> qualities of placemaking, which I hope will, uh, as you move forward, move our focus away from the great cities, Amsterdam or London, Paris, Berlin, New York, uh, wherever, and move to some of the less, the more <coughs> mundane, uh, less notable places on the edges of cities, on the, in the suburbs, in the villages, in small, uh, unfamous towns. Because one of the great uh, um, things I'm most pleased about in my lifetime has been seeing the recovery of great cities. And that's largely been the work of uh, the people like Fred and, and, uh, and Holly and, and, um, and Jean Kiel and so on. But my feeling is that, important though that is, the focus should move away from Amsterdam to some of the broader places that, that exist. And I think this is important just to reinforce the point that Gary makes and, uh, and so on, is that we need to understand the purpose of towns and cities. And transport, which is such an important uh, part of our thinking, transportation, is of course not the purpose of cities. It's a means to an end. The purpose of cities, of course, is the interaction one with another, exchange of various sorts. And there are, it seems to be three kinds, economic exchange, cultural exchange, and social exchange. If you're taking notes at all, uh, money, art, sex. Uh, it seems to me that's, that's... And that any project that we do or work on which doesn't increase the supply of at least one of those three uh, is, is failing. Now, of, of course, um, uh, historically, um, it, uh, our streets and spaces have always been the places where such exchanges and interactions took place. Uh, the, these, our streets make up the, so the huge... Uh, proportion of a huge majority of the public space in, in our towns and cities. And in the last century, the arrival of the motor vehicle didn't initially, uh, it seemed to me, interrupt that, that process, that um, uh, just a bit, a bit more <coughs> one, uh, that the, um, in, in, in scenes like this, a typical high street in a small town in England, you, you've already got quite a lot of traffic moving but the key purposes of interaction and exchange are still the dominant presence in those streets. You don't feel that that formidable uh, woman here is in the wrong place and you wouldn't necessarily try and do something even if you did. Um, but of course, the impact of growing traffic volumes is something that has clearly Im impacted such exchanges. And I'm sure most of you will know that this was first really perfectly encapsulated and quantified by the late, great Donald Appleyard, who studied three identical streets in San Francisco, quantifying uh, three streets with different levels of traffic and quantifying the uh, impact, scientifically the impact, of the decline in exchanges and interactions which that took place. This, the separation of uh, space for exchange and interaction is something that we have devised, we as a, as a society have devised ourselves. To this day, in many American states, jaywalking, that a derogatory term, is, is, is illegal. I, I once got arrested uh, outside a, a conference in, in Los Angeles uh, for wandering across the street. I was rather surprised. I'd just been giving a talk on the importance of jaywalking to road safety. So I was a little surprised by this. But not just in the, in the legislative process, but in the uh, physical design of our cities. In 1963, um, the g British government uh, commissioned uh, the, the Sir Colin Buchanan to head a commission on how cities should respond to rising traffic levels. And his conclusion, very eloquently put in the influential traffic in towns, was that 
uh, traffic and civic aspects of life should be, in his words, segregated, uh, separated, so that here the a vertical separation of, uh, of shopping and civic life from streets, but it's essentially an anti-street vision. That space below is not intended to be used for anything else apart from moving. It wouldn't be a very pleasant place, especially at night. Um, governments worked hard to try to, re to, to free, to remove people from our streets. I'm just old enough to remember being at school when all the schools in the UK were sent a leaflet with this uh, a message urging parents and teachers and children to re readjust their behaviour. Um, this was a major road safety campaign by the British government. <laughs> Uh, really stressing the unforgiving nature of, of our streets. It was a campaign aimed at reducing child pedestrian casualties. Of course, it did so very successfully by reducing the number of child pedestrians. Not surprisingly, parents faced with this message do not allow their children to walk or bicycle to school, whatever. In 1970, in Britain, around about 90% of children walked or bicycled to school, seven and eight year olds are unaccompanied, and by the 1990s that had dropped to 10%, today it's left closer to three. So I think that, that it's important to establish what the problem is. And the problem is one of discrimination, of intense inequality emerging in our society. It's a discrimination which has happened so slowly that we often take it for granted. But it's clearly a discrimination between those capable of driving and those who can't. And by definition, that discriminates against children, older people, those with disabilities, uh, the poorer sections of, of society. Not in Amsterdam, of course, or, or, or other more liberal countries, but in large parts of the world, it's also intensely discriminated against women who predominantly drive less than, than, than men do. So that we've, we've inherited a sort of um, an urban form, it could be anywhere, where the, the bit in the middle uh, is really nothing to do with the place the city is in, exactly the same wherever you are. Uh, if you're not a car driver, you might, you're separated, as was recommended at the time, from that space. <coughs> if you're lucky, you can press a button to apply for permission to cross it. Uh, but it is, of course, not part of the city. It's not part of that crucial framework for exchange. And if we, if we have cities where we are so clearly uh, expecting pedestrians to, and cyclists, of course, to defer to traffic, then we are reducing those key purposes. And we, we sort of accept that the pedestrian is second nature. I mean, forgive me, those from Toronto, a wonderful city, but uh, this, is, this is what I came across on your waterfront, a sort of series of <laughs> of really fairly severe messages to pedestrians. And, and, and that if we expect those who cannot drive to try and make their way through this world, I don't think that we are successful in maintaining the key purposes of cities. Of course, this is probably an unkind cartoon that Fred's already referred to, uh, that we've gradually acquired a whole series of highway measures, no doubt individually useful themselves, but collectively making no place at all. If it is an unkind cartoon, I remind myself that this is approach to London, an incredibly valuable and expensive uh, land, of course, in London. This was formerly the foreground of this coaching house where people changed horses as they arrived in London and the, all the exchanges and interaction accommodation. But we've now decided to dedicate that space to the movement, the transportation needs. And of course, it's not just in central cities. That, that philosophy uh, leeches out into other, the edges of cities. Uh, I, I, I don't want to depress you too much, but you can see how anti-placemaking can creep out through, through highways. Now, um, uh, uh, Hans Mondermann, uh, of whom a little bit more later, uh, scribbled a sketch on a, on a napkin on the first day I met him, pointing out, of course, that we still need highways. The motor car is an extraordinarily valuable and useful part of our economic uh, social structures. For better or worse, we're going to be, it's going to be part of our lives for several generations more. There may be changes in how it's powered, electric driving, and, and, and so forth. But we will need high-speed, uh, dedicated highways. And for them to work well, they require certain characteristics. They are uh, 
and controlled by the state, policed by the state. We have to pass exams to use them, driving tests and so forth. We expect them to be linear, consistent and single purpose. We don't use them for anything else apart from moving around. And we expect them to be uh, systematic and measurable and to have a very simple relationship with the state through signs and markings and, and rules, speed limits and so on, uh, to allow us to use them. And that's important. But the more we've learned from Jane Jacobs and other great pioneers about what makes public space work well, the key essential component for cities, the more we've realized that exactly the opposite characteristics apply. It's rarely uh, successful public space if it's heavily policed by the state. It tends to be much more uh, spatial, of course, much more unpredictable, which is why we like it. We don't quite know who we're going to meet or what we're going to find. Uh, it tends to be much more based on the local context, much more flexible over time, and crucially, we negotiate and use it through a much more complex range of human communication methods, how we move, how we dress, how we present ourselves, and all those complexities. And if the difficulty...